invite you to open Scripture with me to uh, Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, you're welcome to use one of ours. Uh, they're located in the seats in front of you. Uh, you can also follow along on the screen. Uh, the, words, uh, the words will be there as well. Philippians chapter 3. Uh, listen for the word of the Lord this morning. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. And so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of, take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if, if, some, if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have, a, have us as a model, keep your eye on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control, will transform lo our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How many of you have a long weekend this weekend? Yeah? Okay, it, you can raise your hand if you're retired too, that's okay. You have a long weekend this weekend, right? This is a weekend of celebration. You know, it started Friday, for some people apparently it started last week Monday, uh, and it's a long weekend of celebration that we call Independence Day. Uh, and it's a day that we celebrate our independence as a nation. It's a time in which we remember that we are a free country. This is one of my favorite holidays. It really is. I mean, parades, fireworks, uh, grilling out, friends and family, warm weather. Like, it's, it is, it, it's, it's got to be one of my favorite holidays. Of, of all of the kind of the uh, national holidays that we celebrate, this is, this is easily uh, one of my favorite. And, and we remember. We remember it like we do on Memorial Day. We remember these freedoms. We remember those uh, who, who have fought, those who have died, those who are continuing to fight, to protect and defend those freedoms. To, to, to defend and, and protect all that is the United States of America. 
But if I'm honest, this is probably the single most difficult Sunday to preach on as a pastor. Because we, there, there's some kind of underlying expectation for what we're going to talk about when we come into worship on Sunday, on this Sunday in particular. There is an expectation that, that things are going to be patriotic, per se. That, that we'll sing patriotic hymns, which you have, probably have already noticed we didn't. And uh, that the, the message is going to be uh, patriotic in origin. And, and, and that it's difficult for me because I, I think, I think, and, and it, it, can, it has been difficult for me. All, of the, all the time I have all, I've been in ministry, whether it's as a worship leader or as a pastor now, it, it has been a difficult Sunday because it walks a very fine line. It always walks a very fine line between uh, coming into worship and worshiping God and being thankful for the blessings that he's given us here in America and, and being able to celebrate that because that's good. And it, it, it comes close, at least I've seen it and heard it and experienced it come close sometimes to, to sounding a little bit more like worshiping the country. And, and so there's a, there's a danger there it's a, it's a fine line to walk. And, and, and I guess as maybe perhaps as a pastor and, and being charged with walking that line and walking it well, I, I get a little bit of a pit in my stomach because I want to do that well. There's a bit of a duality that, that kind of takes place on these patriotic holidays where the, the ideas of, of nationalism and, and patriotism, which aren't bad. Please don't hear me say that America is bad, because I'm not saying that. But these ideas of nationalism and patriotism start to creep into our gospel message a little bit. And that's dangerous. That can be very, very dangerous. Because being American doesn't necessarily equal being Christian. Having a particular political affiliation, Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, you know, you could name it, there's, a, there's many, right? That doesn't necessarily equal being Christian. Having a particular set of constitutional rights doesn't equal being Christian. And so, it's a fine line to walk. And, and, and so, bear with me this morning as, as we try to walk that line together a little bit. And, and please, once again, I just, I just want to say this. And I, I, I wrote this in about like 10 different spots throughout my sermon notes. Don't hear what I'm not saying. What I'm not saying is that America is bad. I'm not saying that. America, I believe America is great. It's a great nation. We are blessed to live here. Right? Don't hear me saying that Independence Day or Memorial Day or any other you know, national holiday is bad. I'm not saying that. I think it's good to celebrate these things. I'm not saying that, that the military service shouldn't be honored. It should. It should. We are blessed to have people who have served in such a capacity and, and we're thankful for their willingness to sacrifice whether a part or all of their lives for such a cause. And I'm not saying that celebrating is bad either. Because it is. It's good. Right? It's gonna, Tuesday's going to be a really great day. It, it, it's just going to be fun. Right? You, you're with family, you're with friends, you get good food, there's a parade, you get candy. I mean, it's, what's not to like? What's not to like? It's not a bad thing. So as I'm thinking about all this, Philippians 3 comes into mind. I think Paul speaks to this, this sort of line that we have to walk as those who are in Christ, those whose identity is, is in Christ. Because Paul's writing from prison here. And Paul is in prison because he has been preaching the gospel. See, Paul is a citizen of the Roman Empire. In the Roman Empire, when you preached the gospel, you got thrown in prison. Because it wasn't okay. They didn't have freedom of religion. They didn't have all of the things that America has. They encouraged emperor worship. And Paul is in chains for the gospel. He says this multiple times throughout a lot of his letters. 
that he's in chains for the gospel. He is in prison because he has committed his life to Christ. And as he's writing, he's encouraging those he's writing to to commit to that same path, not necessarily going to jail, but to commit himself to that same path of putting Jesus at the forefront of their lives. That theme is seen in the book of Philippians, in in, in chapter 2, where he writes about Jesus who is in very nature God, but didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. He's talking about Jesus coming down from heaven and and taking on human flesh and living the life that he lived and dying the death that he died for us. And he's talking about following Christ's example of laying down himself, laying down his own advantages, right? Jesus is God. And he could have very well come to earth and used that to his advantage. But he didn't. Paul has many, many advantages in his life. He is the quintessential Jewish person. He is, he, I mean, he is at the highest of high levels. He's a religious leader. He, he had everything, right? And he was a Roman citizen. That didn't actually happen very often. You, you were either, oftentimes you were either a Jew or you were a Roman citizen. Paul is both. And so he has the advantage of both things in his life and and can pretty much do and go and be whatever he wants to be and say whatever he wants to say. And yet he says what? I lay it all down. Paul has a reason to want the life that he had. Now let's be honest with ourselves for a moment. We have many many advantages in America. Yes? We are a nation that is blessed. Our, we've been, our, we, we have, we, I mean, the, the United States controls like 70% of like all of the world's resources. We have, we use and control. We have so much. We literally have our cake and we can eat it too. And some of us probably will on Tuesday, right? We, we can do that. We have so much. We can work harder. We can make more money. We have bigger houses, more stuff. We, we can do anything. We can go anywhere. We have everything. We have been blessed beyond our means. We have freedom. A freedom that is unlike any other freedom in the entire world. We have so much much. And let's just be honest. All of that is a pretty darn good reason to want the life that we have. Yeah? I mean, we have so much, there's no, there's no real reason for us to not want that. <laughs> Who doesn't? And yet, Paul's words here, Paul's words here echo the writer of Ecclesiastes. I don't think, we, we haven't read much from Ecclesiastes. Someday we will. It's a really great book. But the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, at one point in time, he looks at everything that he has and everything. It's, I, I, it's, it's Solomon, and he has everything. And, and he, he literally, I mean, he's, rich, he's the richest person in the entire world at that time. He, he's wise and everything. He looks at it all and he says, meaningless. Meaningless. Vanity. It's all just vanity. And, and Paul's words echo that here. Meaningless. Whatever gains he writes, to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. That is stark. You know, there are some times when when we can read a passage and, and the, the Greek words that are translated into English have kind of, they carry other meanings with them and it, it kind of brings out a fullness in, in the text and we go, oh yeah, that's, that's nice, that's nice. The only word that's found there that's going to make this text any different is the word garbage. The word garbage actually means human waste. And I'm not talking about the trash that you throw out. I'm talking about the stuff you flush down the toilet. That kind of garbage. Everything, every advantage that Paul has 
is like poop. I, <laughs> you can laugh. It's okay. Your pastor just said poop. It's good, right? Everything that he had, everything that he had, he considers it that worthless. There's nothing that it can do. There's nothing that it's good for. <laughs> you know, it's really easy. It's really easy for us uh, when, when, when we come to Christ or when you, when you meet somebody and, and, and let's just say, you know, we, we lead a person to Christ who's had a, a difficult life or has been doing drugs or is an alcoholic or something like that and then they find Jesus, yeah? And, and we celebrate that and it's really easy for us to say, but you've got to you put that stuff aside. You can't be an alcoholic and be a Christian. Like, those things are at odds. You're not supposed to do that. Like, you've got to get clean, right? Or somebody who's doing drugs. No, you've got to get clean from that. Or, or, you know, I mean, there's any number of things, right? Pornography addictions, any sort of addiction. It's really easy to renounce those things when you find Christ. You say, I don't, that's bad stuff. It's easy to, to you know, renounce the, all the isms of life, all those things that, that we consider to be bad, greed, lust, and, you know, you can go on and on. The list goes on forever. It's easy to renounce those things. But I wonder if we are so quick to renounce things that we would consider advantageous for us in our lives for the sake of the gospel. Because we just named off a whole darn big list of things that are our advantage, our blessing, our benefit by being Americans that Paul considers a loss for the sake of Christ. And we're not so quick to want to renounce those things, are we? We're not so readily willing to lay them down. I mean, I'm just being honest. I, I'm not. I, I really don't prefer to not have freedom. I really don't prefer to not have the right to a freedom of religion or a freedom to gather, a freedom to say what I feel needs to be said. I don't want to lay those things down. I really like those things. And I want to keep them. But Scripture considers them garbage in comparison to the all-surpassing worth of knowing Christ and being found in Him. Now, last week, uh, we had Ben DeVogue here. If you weren't here last week, uh, Ben uh, went to uh, India uh, with uh, another pastor and they had a pastor's conference and he experienced life in India. And life in India is, is quite different than, than life in the United States of America. Uh, India is a Hindu nation and, if, uh, and they have a, a sort of caste system. So that means that uh, the people are basically ranked from like, you know, 10 to 0, Right? And, and, and when you're in this kind of, when you're a Hindu and you're in this caste system, you know, if you're, if you're 10, you pretty much have it all. Like, this is where Paul is. And, and if, if, if you're zero, this is like, you're like the, the homeless person who has no job and is, is drunk all the time or something like that. Somebody's pretty, you know, pretty down on their luck. In India, when you convert from Hindu to Christianity, you're at like negative one. Like, you're not even on the scale of zero to 10 in the caste system. You are the worst of the worst of the worst. And, and those that, that convert to Christianity in India find themselves often losing their jobs, forced to leave their communities, their homes. Uh, they're often, like everything is taken from them and in some cases experience uh, physical violence against them and against their families because they follow Christ. Just to put that in perspective, we literally have no concept of what that means in America. Right? Nobody here is afraid of getting beaten when you walk out the door today. Especially not in Hopkins. Right? Pretty much not afraid of that in Hopkins. Even if you're not a Christian, you're not afraid of that in Hopkins. But when you are, you know, as a matter of fact, in America, being a Christian is actually an advantage. There, there is a, a particular advantage that we find in America to, to being Christian. But Scripture reminds us, it, it reminds us of, of perhaps a perspective and perhaps uh, a life change that, that might or could take place if, if we're following Christ. 
Right? Would you readily renounce the advantages that you have in America for the sake of the cross? If becoming Christian meant that you couldn't have access to health care anymore. Or you had to leave your home, your job, your business, everything that you've built in your own life. What if it meant you weren't welcome in Hopkins anymore if you were a Christian? That's a difficult thing. And I think the reason that I've been wrestling with it so much is because I don't want to leave Hopkins. I don't think any of, anybody else does either, right? When, when you're confronted with that and you're saying, would I renounce, would I, would I walk away from everything that I have in this life or any one thing that I have in this life because I believe in Christ? And I have to be honest with myself and say, that would be a difficult decision. But when we look at Scripture, when we're faced with Scripture this morning, we see a faith that requires sacrifice. Now in America, faith doesn't really require that much of a sacrifice. Our life in Christ looks quite similar to our life without Christ. And, and, and there's a danger in that. Because, because Christ is first. And Christ is supposed to be first. The gospel is supposed to be at the center of all that we do and all that we are. And I think the discomfort that I find in preaching on a day like today is that too often we really, 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 and I, I'm including myself in this, I'm, I'm bearing my soul to you right now, too often we want Christ and. Right? We want Christ and everything else. And I find this a little true of myself too. I, I see that in my life because I'm the one that I'm, I'm more than willing to speak up for uh, when it seems like my right to free speech is being taken away. Or my, my right to, uh, to uh, have freedom of religion is taken away because of this or that, right? I'm willing to fight that battle, but am I so willing to go out and share the gospel? I want my comforts. I want my Americanism. <laughs> and sometimes I do that at the expense of who I am in Christ. And Paul reminds us of this. He says, we are citizens of heaven. Right? Our citizenship is in heaven. What is a citizen? Well, a citizen is somebody who has a legal or, uh, a legal or, or a protective status in a particular country, right? You, you have rights, you have protection, uh, you often adopt a culture of, of, that, of that nation, of that country. You are a, a citizen. Well, our citizenship is in heaven. Which means that if that's, if that's true, that means that we are adopting a, a different culture. It means that God protects us. Right? Because our citizenship is in heaven. If our citizenship is in heaven, God is our king. He's the ruler. And, and, and we have uh, the protection of him. He says he's always with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Uh, scripture uh, calls him our shield, our sword. It, 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 there's all sorts of, of metaphors about that. But it also means that we are adopting a different culture. And I wonder what that means. I, I, I mean, when Scripture says anyone who's in Christ is a new creation... Does that mean that our life looks different now that we've found Christ than it did before? I have to swallow real hard and say, I, I don't know that it does. At least not always. Now, again, let's make sure that we're not hearing what I'm not saying. You get that not hearing, the double negative there. We're not hearing what I'm not saying. So you're not hearing me say that, that we shouldn't celebrate. You're not hearing me say that, that America's bad or anything like that. I'm not saying those things. But what I'm saying is, and I think what Scripture is telling us here and reminding us this morning is that if we are in Christ, our lives are somehow different. And that casts a perspective on a, a national political holiday. 
that we need to keep in mind. If the gospel is going to be at the center of who we are, and, and, and Christ is, is kind of our focus, right? We run the race looking towards Christ, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. Then we celebrate in a little bit of a different light, perhaps. We celebrate being thankful to God for what He has offered us through our physical, earthly citizenship. We are thankful to God for the freedoms that are accorded to us because of where we live, because of where we are born. We are thankful to God for those who serve, those who fight, those who die for those freedoms. But if push comes to shove, we remember that the most important things in our lives don't come from a government or a political party. The most important thing in our life, the hope that we have, doesn't come because there is a Republican or a Democrat in the White House. Or that our particular senator or House representative happens to be, happens to align with our views of the world. Our hope is found in Jesus Christ. And everything else is a distant second in comparison. And Paul reminds the people that he's writing to as well. Because he makes this sound really good, right? He, he writes this really nice line and, and, I mean, you could read it and be like, wow, Paul is like the perfect Christian. And then he reminds us, no, not that I have already obtained all this. I am striving each day to take hold of that, the gospel, for which Christ took hold of me. And that is the beauty of these words. So we're faced with a little bit of a discomfort here. Faced with a little bit of uncomfortableness, right? We're faced with this kind of dichotomy of of being an American and being a Christian. And we realize that, meh, we're not quite there yet, perhaps. I'm realizing that. I've realized that all week this week. And And I've kind of wrestled with that a little bit. But then Paul reminds us, you know, I'm not there yet either. And he doesn't condemn them. He doesn't tell them that they're terrible and that they're, you know, they're never going to get there. He says, no, like, like you guys, I too am striving to take hold of that. I'm striving to grasp what that means. I'm striving to figure that out in my life. What does it mean to put everything else aside for the sake of the gospel? What does it mean to be found in Him? To literally have your identity be in Christ instead of all the other things that the world has to offer. And Paul, Paul, the quintessential Christian, like he is, I mean, basically the writer of the New Testament, says, I'm still working on it too. And he reminds us in other places, all throughout the New Testament, there's no condemnation. You know, it's, it's not about condemning. It's not about making us feel bad. I, I think scripture, scripture makes us uncomfortable. We call that conviction. We call it the work of the Holy Spirit working on us to remind us that God's not done with us yet, that He's still building into us, that He loves us enough that He's continuing to work on us to shape and mold us into the image of His Son, Jesus. We can be thankful for that. Praise God He's not done with us yet because, oof, I know... I know what goes on inside of me, and I'm glad that, I'm glad that he's still working that out. So it, it's, it's this ongoing thing. And so as we, as we approach you know, this holiday, again, we should celebrate because God has blessed us with a great, a great thing that is the United States of America, that God has blessed us so richly beyond anything we could have ever asked or imagined. And yet we need to remember We need to remember what should be at the forefront of our minds, at the forefront of our identity, which is Jesus Christ. And like Paul, we continue to walk that journey of God working on us, reminding us day after day after day who we are and whose we are. That God loves us as His children and that He continues to, daily to show us that love and to call us into deeper relationship with Him.
May that be true for us this week as we celebrate. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Um, Lord, thanks. Thank you for the way that you continually work in us. Uh, Lord, sometimes it's difficult to be confronted uh, with some of our own uh, continuing things that are going on inside of us. It's difficult for us to, to be confronted with the things that, that we maybe set up as idols in our own lives. It's difficult for us to admit that, and it's even more difficult for us to want to lay those things down. But Lord, we're thankful we're thankful that you don't turn your face from us, that you don't walk away from us, but instead you open your arms to embrace us that much more. And so, Lord, we pray that as, as we realize this, as the Spirit continues to turn up things in our hearts and in our minds, God, that we would, uh, we would turn towards you. And that we would, we would see the vision that you have of us, your righteous children whom you love, and whom you call deeper and deeper into relationship with you every day. But help us to that end. Show us where to walk and how you want us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the ways that God reminds us who we are and whose we are is, is through communion. Because we come to a table that is not our own. And we come unworthy of the invitation that we have received. But we come because God in Jesus Christ has made us clean and is continuing to reveal Himself. We come to commune with Him, to meet Him here, We've talked about this in the past. This is there's a unique way that God meets us here in in communion. And and we don't fully understand it, but something happens here. So I want to encourage you to open yourself to that. We come because we have hope. We have hope in something greater than anything in this world. Hope in Jesus Christ. That in him we have salvation and eternal life. We come to remember that that eternal life cost him something. It cost him his life. He died so that we can truly be free. Free of our sins, free of our guilt, free of our shame, free of our past. And that we can be, as Paul says, found in him. Looking forward to that day when Christ will return And we will be made like unto him in his glory. And he reminds us of this. All of that we are reminded of when we come to the table.